I was 20 years of age, or coming up to 20 years of age, <coughs> having been born in 1923. <laughs> and I decided that I didn't want to go in the army and I didn't want to go in the navy, so I decided I was going to volunteer for the RAF. A week or so before I was 20, I decided that I was going to decide where I was going, not the civilian, not the civilian organization. So I went across the road from where I was employed and there happened to be an RAF recruiting officer. So I said to him, um, did they want pe people in the RAF? And his answer was, do we want them? He said, we want as many as we can get. He said, what would you like to do? I said, well, I'd like to fly. That's fine, he said. Then asked me what I was doing then. Well, I was just about finishing my apprenticeship as a mechanical engineer. And he said to me, we've got just the job for you. I said, what's that, sir? He said, you're going to be a flight engineer. But Canada had just come into the war and Canada didn't have any facilities for training engineers. They trained pilots and navigators, but not flight engineers. So they said, would I like to join a Canadian crew? I said, yes, I don't mind at all. So I met up with the, the Canadians. Now this is another thing. You went to the what was known as the heavy conversion unit, in other words, where all these people met up. And nobody said to you, you will go to this crew or they will take you. You were allowed to wander around and meet people and chat people and then go back eventually, well, fairly quickly, but in reasonably good time, to the CO the commanding officer and say, we've decided, sir, we'd like to join up as a crew, the seven of us. I had six nice, very nice chaps, Canadians, and they were looking for a, a flight engineer. And um, we chatted to each other and we said, right, we'll go back to the station commander and say, we'd like to fly together. And that's how it started. There was no pushing anybody into anything. And of course, immediately you start training then as a crew to fly and what to do in the aircraft in emergencies and things like that. And of course, I'd never been up in a Halifax or a, or a Lancaster in any case before that. I'd been in them on the ground, but not flying in them. So we started all our flying training and eventually fairly quickly actually got passed out as a crew uh, and then waited then to be posted um, to a, a, a bomber station and we got posted to Leeming. For, there were two squadrons there, both Canadian squadrons, 427 squadron and 429 squadron, the Bison squadron and the Lion squadron. And the one I went on to was 429 Squadron, and that was the Bison Squadron. The one thing we always, <laughs> the rest of the crew, we always used to tell our bomb aimer off, because if the bomb aimer proved to be very good and accurate, you got put on mining. Now this was totally different to bombing, if you were bombing, you were bombing from 18, 20,000 feet most of the time. But if you were mining, you were dropping mines from five or 600 feet. And the idea was you laid them in the waters of uh, various areas where you knew the German battleships and things like that. 
so before they could come out and, and destroy the um, food convoys that were crossing from England during the war, um, they had to clear the mines first. And of course, as soon as they started doing that, we started putting some more down as well to make it even more difficult for them. When we were laying mines in the Norwegian fjords, a lot of the houses were on the hillsides and the people used to come out and wave to you. We'd be flying there, they'd be stood on their doorstep and we'd be flying here at five or six hundred feet level with them and they used to wave like mad to us and we'd wave back and the pilot would wobble the wings and let them know we'd seen them and go on and get our mining done and get back again. So we did a mixture. We did high level bombing, we did night bombing, we did bay bombing, and all together we did 31 operations as a crew. Now, people say to me, oh, that wasn't bad, was it? I'll say it was damned good, because if you look at the statistics for Bomber Command during the war, 47% were killed. So if you were in the other 53%, you were reasonably lucky. <laughs> anyway, we were in that 53% and we came through with it. The thing that I'm ever very pleased about is that we remained friends after the war ended. And I'd been to Canada a couple of times and people from Canada been over, but unfortunately, all the members of my crew all died at a relatively early age, but I stayed friends with their children. And a couple of the trips I went to Canada on, my daughter went with me, Margaret, were to meet up with the children and stay with them. But I used to be very busy when I went there because they would say, do you mind? I'd say, what? We've booked you to go to the school and talk to the children, or this school or that school. And um, so I did quite a lot of talks to children about what it was like in Bomber Command during the war. <laughs>